Hello everyone. In this video, we're going to be solving a transcendental equation. I call this transcendental because recently someone brought it to my attention. I forgot who, but if you are the person, please let us know. I think somebody commented and said that aren't these transcendental equations? Because I was calling these non-standard equations and I guess they could be called non-standard as well, but uh, there's a broader category. So there's the algebraic equations, the polynomial equations, where you have a polynomial, and then there's these mixture of different kinds. So we have one of those equations, which could be called transcendental, not because E is a transcendental number, but because we're mixing these things together. E to the X plus X plus one equals zero. So we're gonna be, we're gonna try to solve for X. Can you guess any solutions? Well, one of the things you can do is look at the graph of these functions. Maybe they're going to be tangent to each other. What do I mean by these functions, right? What are these? So those functions that I'm referring to is basically if you can kind of split it up into two pieces, like maybe put the e to the x plus x together and leave the negative one alone like this. And you can kind of look at the behavior of both of these functions. But one of these is a constant. And this might kind of give you an idea, at least about the number of solutions. For example, how many real solutions do we get from here? And I think one, you know why? The reason behind that is actually very simple, but important. Look at the left-hand side, let's call this f of x and let's call this g of x. Look at f of x, what do you see? If you don't see what I'm talking about, let's go ahead and differentiate f of x. What's the derivative of e to the x plus x? E, the derivative of e to the power x is itself, which is a super duper interesting function, right? plus the derivative of x is 1. So the derivative of e to the x plus x is e to the x plus 1, which is uh, always positive, because e to the x cannot be negative, cannot be even 0, unless x is negative infinity, which is not a number. So plus 1, definitely going to be positive. What does that mean? If the derivative of a function is positive, that means that function f is increasing. So this implies f is increasing. Nice. And what is the big deal about increasing functions? Well, the right-hand side, g of x equals negative 1. If you differentiate it, you're going to get 0. What does that mean? The rate of change of this function is 0, which means it doesn't change. No vary. It doesn't vary, right? No varies. No variables. It's a constant. So it's a horizontal line. If you graph it, it's going to look like this. g of x is negative 1. It's probably going to look something like this, right? Going through negative 1. Awesome. What about the other function? Well, if you think about it, like if you replace x with 0, you're going to get 1. So at 0, it's going to go through 1. As x approaches negative infinity, you know, e to the x is going to approach 0, x is going to approach negative infinity. So it's probably going to go down like this. I don't think there it's going to intersect the x-axis because it can't be 0, right? Can it? I haven't checked, actually. Uh, if this is 0, then we're going to get another equation, which will be interesting. But anyways, and you're going to notice that as x approaches infinity, uh, it's just going to go up. So in other words, we ha always have an increasing function. And we do have, by the way, of course, it is it is going to cut the x-axis, of course, because we want them to intersect, right? Of course. So what's going to happen is that they will intersect at some point. And there will only be one intersection point because you have an increasing function intersected by a horizontal line. Does that make sense? So at least this gives us an idea about the number of solutions. It doesn't give us the solution, but it just gives us the number of solutions. But let's go and look at it from a different perspective. For example, I can take this equation and write it as follows. e to the x equals negative x minus 1. Now, I'll give you a nicer graph towards the end, but for right now, just bear with me. Negative x minus 1 is just something like this, right? And then we have the e to the x. Again, the same scenario applies. Uh, they're going to intersect at a single point. Why? One is decreasing, one is increasing. So get the idea? We know there's one solution, but the million dollar question is, how do you find that solution? And can we find it algebraically? Can we find it like, what's the right word? Um, I can't remember. It's not synthetically, but um, I don't know. They're accurately, in other words, like not, not by approximations or anything. I just couldn't remember the right word for it. But anyways, if I do, I'll get back to you on that one. So 
Yes, we can find the number of solutions from here really quick, but it doesn't give us the solution. So we kind of need to use a different approach. That's what makes this equation so special and transcendental because you couldn't just, you know, find the solution. And if you could guess in some cases, of course, uh, you should guess. For example, uh, e to the x equals, let's see, x plus 1 definitely has an easy solution, x equals 0, right? So you can kind of guess in some cases, but we have the quite the opposite. Uh, so it's going to be different, obviously, right? I mean, can we still use zero? No. Can we use negative zero? No, it's the same thing. So how do we solve this problem? The presence of e to the x along with a linear polynomial is actually promising. And I'll tell you why in a little bit that is promising. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to go ahead and do uh, the separation uh, this way. Okay, let's go ahead and split e to the x from the polynomial piece. And then uh, we will kind of keep the negative x minus 1 on the right-hand side and bring over the e to the x. And the reason behind that is if I bring, if I divide both sides by negative x minus 1, then I'll be stuck with a somewhat rational function, which is not very easy to solve, right? Which is impossible probably uh, algebraically or whatever the right word was. Instead, I'm going to keep this here and bring the e to the x over because dividing my e to the x is actually easier. It just changes the exponent, which can be fixed. What am I talking about? Some of you probably realize what I'm talking about, but I don't want to spoil the surprise because I'll still have to tell you what I'm getting to. So, or getting at. We can now write this as negative x minus 1 times e to the power negative x, and this becomes 1, which is nice. So we have a constant on one side, which is super duper nice, and something like this on the left-hand side. Now, what do you do with this? We can do the following. We can go ahead and divide both sides by e, and probably some of you couldn't tell what I'm getting at, but I'm pretty sure uh, most of you figured it out. And yes, if you said Lambert's W function, you got it. That's what I'm trying to get at, because look at this. If you combine these two things, you get e to the power negative x minus 1, and ta-da! We have our Lambertable product, which is the product log. So whenever you have something t e to the t like this, you can apply Lambert's w on both sides and you can get a t out of this. So that's Lambert's w function. By the way, I just realized on uh, not, um, not notability, what is the other tool that I always use? Not Desmos. Uh, Wolfram Alpha, yes. Wolfram Alpha can also interpret Lambert W something. It used to use product log, but I realized, because I keep entering product log, it didn't give me the answer. It's like, Wolfram Alpha doesn't understand your query. Come on, Wolfram Alpha. You can be smarter than this. And I realized, okay, it also recognizes this notation. Maybe it's a new thing. Maybe it's been around. I don't know. I just noticed today. Anyway, so if you go ahead and move this a little bit this way, so we can W both sides easily. So I'm going to go ahead and apply W here and here, which is, this is Lambert's W function. And as you know, it's going to give us the output T. Let's go ahead and erase this area because we need it. And now I'm going to go ahead and apply it to this T, E to the T, that's my T, by the way, will give us as output negative X minus one, and that's equal to W of 1 over E. Whatever that is, we'll find out uh, towards the end, okay? Don't worry about it. But my goal is to solve for X, so why don't we just add X to both sides, put the X on the right, and bring the Lambert W over here. So that's going to become X equals negative W of 1 over E minus 1, because minus 1 has to stay with the, the W uh, to give us X by itself. Make sense? So this should be the answer. But what is W of 1 over E and what is the opposite of that? Let's go ahead and take a look at that right now and we'll finish up with the numerical solution. Okay, ready, set, and go. Yes, well, from alpha gives us the answer like this. The answer is approximately negative 1.278464542276, so on and so forth. You get the idea. That's a very long decimal. And we can kind of look at a couple of graphs that I already talked to you about. Yes, uh, if you click on the intersection point, you, uh, Desmos will tell you what that value is approximately, and it agrees with our findings. And then another way to approach the graph is comparing x plus 1, which is something we haven't done, 
with negative e to the x, and we get the same solution. And this brings us to the end of this video. Thank you for watching. I hope you enjoyed it. Please let me know. Don't forget to comment, like, and subscribe. I'll see you next time with another video. Until then, be safe, take care, and bye-bye.